Latin America. So this is a very, if you heard of Cliff Notes, that's what this is. Abbreviated history of Latin America and what went on down there, and then we'll get into some other aspects of this. Well, normally here in the United States, we date history of Latin America with the arrival of Columbus, 1492, which, of course, is false because people have been down there for much, much longer doing a variety of interesting things. Came about, of course, Columbus was a navigator sa sailing with uh, financial support. The king and queen of Spain sailed in 1492, corresponded to the, exactly the same year when the, uh, the invaders from the south, Islamic, were defeated in Granada, so the Muslims were, were beaten. There was money left over in Spain. There were people. What are you going to do? Well, let's go explore the new world. And so Columbus set sail, come over here, made various trips, arrived, discovered that this area was already populated. He thought he had reached the Far East, the Indies. And so, of course, he named the people he came in contact with Indians. And immediately, of course, the, uh, the Spanish, the Europeans became involved in the new world. But there were other groups over here already. And here's a map showing some of the different cultural groups that existed at that time. And the map is in two parts. Here's the lower part. And you can see that the numbers indicate various uh, types of civilization. So one, these would be high civilization. So the area of the Incas here in the, in the area of the Andes or the Mayas, the region of the Aztecs in central Mexico. On the other hand, you, other, you had other groups that were basically nomadic hunters and gatherers living in the forest. A variety of groups, just as an example, look at the various populations in the Caribbean. You had the Caribs, you had the uh, descendants of the Arawaks, Taino. Uh, with time, many of these people, of course, uh, disappeared. We'll come back and talk about some of this. So there were a variety of people here at the time of the arrival of the Europeans, but there were three areas of dominant civilizations where various civilizations had emerged. One was the area of the Incas down in South America. We've talked about that some already, or at least Rod has. The Mayas in Central America, and then the area of the Aztecs. The Aztecs were the most recent arrival of a variety of groups that had come into this area, into the central region of Mexico, coming down from the north and sort of supplanting the groups that they were there before. Each one of these groups had established uh, various technologies, uh, types of writing, ways of um, farming, and a, a host of other technologies that were of significance within these areas. The groups were rapidly conquered by the, by the uh, Spanish really with very little effort. So here's a depiction of Cortez in central Mexico attacking the capital of the, uh, of the Aztecs out in the middle of Lake Texcoco, defeating uh, supposedly with maybe about six or 700 Europeans, much larger force because Cortez actually mobilized uh, many of the other surrounding tribal groups who had very little, very little use for the, for the Aztecs. Similar events with Pizarro in Peru conquering the Incas. And after a very short period of time, then you find the Europeans, the Spanish in particular, dominating their areas within the New World. The true impact of this conquest, though, was not the battles, was not the warfare. All of that, uh, relatively little loss of life as a, as a result of that. But what was the true impact? was the depopulation of Latin America due to the introduction of diseases. Here you see population figures, and these, these numbers vary uh, widely. Different scholars have different estimates, but there were tens of millions of people in what we call Latin America at the time of first contact. About 150 years later, that number was down to 8 million. And these were losses due almost entirely to the introduction of diseases for which the natives in the New World had no immunity. 
they had not been exposed to smallpox, influenza, these diseases previously, and so they succumbed. Uh, Europeans would contract the disease, would get well, not the indigenous Americans. They would get the disease and they would die. Uh, I put a picture up there. This is kind of a popular myth, uh, and uh, that is that uh, the Europeans introduced blankets contaminated with smallpox. Everything I've read indicates that that's a myth. It did not happen. First of all, the smallpox doesn't survive uh, very long in those conditions. And so anyway, forget all of that. But European, Europe's most powerful weapon, germs, not that they used it uh, on purpose, but it was simply what came along with their involvement in the New World. Uh, you may have read the book by Jared Diamond, Guns, Germs, and Steel. He talks about this extensively. In his, in his discussion. The Spanish came to the New World, quickly became involved, various uh, explorers into the New World, looking for gold and anything of value. What they discovered was silver. What you're looking at here is Cerro Rico, which is a mountain of silver outside or near the city of Potosi in Bolivia. Potosi, at that time in Upper Peru, became the largest city in the New World. A couple of hundred thousand people living there, and they were mining silver. They were exporting this silver back to Europe, and this then was part of what was known as mercantilism. This was the economic system that emerged as a result of this contact. The Spanish and then later the Portuguese maintained very tight control over the new, over their colonies in the New World. Uh, the they would bring material wealth to the old country, and in this case, silver, and uh, very little of economic value would flow back to the new world. And so it was taking from the new world the value, but not really replacing very much. The primary source of labor, of course, were the indigenous populations in the new world. And so all of the trade relations, all of the contacts were between the colonies and the mother country. Uh, there was very little reason, very little interaction among the various areas within the New World. They were all producing raw materials for export back to Spain. The fleet would form up in South America, Potosí, bring the ore down to the coast, transship it across to Panama, and as Rod mentioned the other day, some of it would go up the west side of Mexico and ultimately destined for, for Asia. Most of it then was transshipped across the isthmus. There was no canal at that time. The fleet then would continue on back to, back to uh, Europe. This was highly controlled. Uh, everything was strictly monitored by the king. The king got a, uh, a royal percentage of everything that was shipped. And so there was no uh, freedom. This made it uh, quite... Uh, a simple matter for pirates then to attack the fleet. Every, there, everything was bunched up. You knew where the fleet was, and so they would assault it. Majority of the population in Latin America did not benefit particularly from the trade. You had the indigenous people who were working in the mines, uh, and then the small group of the uh, colonial of the, of, the, of the Europeans who were over here also didn't uh, didn't amass great wealth out of this. Probably it didn't do a whole lot for Spain as well. It simply increased in rates of inflation in Spain, actually reduced the amount of industry that was produced in Spain. So all of this wealth flowing back to Spain did not necessarily create great benefit for the, for the mother country. Well, as you move forward in time and without going into a lot of detail, areas in Latin America then uh, revolt and become independent. You have a couple of areas that were the center of revolution. One was in Venezuela, and of course Bolivar was the leader of the revolution in, in that area. Down south in Argentina, San Martin uh, fomented revolution. Uh, by this time, the, the silver had played out. There was uh, very, uh, very little to hold the Spanish interest in the New World. And so uh, there was warfare, conflict, but the outcome was almost a foregone conclusion. These areas eventually then become independent from Spain and 
from that time forward, they go their own way. Similar up in middle America, Mexico. Uh, here is Padre Hidalgo. Uh, depiction of the Grito de Dolores. This is the church at Dolores. And uh, he, in front of the church, raised his voice. And they, uh, his followers together, they marched to Mexico City. If they'd gone ahead and attacked at that time, it probably would have ended things at that point. But uh, for some reason, they withdrew, and so war continued. But eventually, Mexico then also becomes independent from Spanish rule. Well, Brazil was Portuguese. So how did Portugal get into the picture? What happened there? Portugal is a small country along the western side of the Iber Iberian Peninsula in Spain. But at that time, very significant in this whole exploration of overseas areas. They had a leader, he wasn't the king, but he was a prince, Henry the Navigator, who developed uh, an area for training, a place called Sagres, where he would bring the best shipbuilders, chart makers, navigators, and they then developed major emphasis on navigation, they explored down the coast of Africa, all of this with the objective of finding a route to the Far East. That was where everybody wanted to go. That's what motivated Columbus to come west. And because of the exploration and the involvement of the, um, of the Portuguese, there was concern that the two countries in Iberia might go to war with each other. And so under the auspices of the, uh, of the Pope, they decided to divide the world. They drew a line. Here you see the one on the right first, and then they did another one in 1494 and say the world belongs to Spain and Portugal. Everything west of that line will be Spanish. Everything to the east is Portuguese. And so the two countries then went about the business of exploring, developing their own territory. Uh, not sure exactly what happened, but eventually the Portuguese sent explorations down and uh, landed on their area of South America that is today Brazil laid claim to it, but then went about the business of exploring routes to the Far East. And they developed then the trade of the Far East to the Spice Islands, parts of India, that all the way up until about 1600 when you then see the Dutch begin to take over uh, those areas of the world. So the Portuguese then did establish themselves in Brazil, had little use for Brazil. They didn't discover high civilizations, didn't discover mineral wealth of any sort. And so they established a few colonies along the coast. One of them was up here in Pernambuco and began to grow sugarcane in those areas. What you're looking at here are the captaincies uh, passed out to people in favor, uh, favorites of the king. These were, uh, were given these grants. And most of them were very, uh, very, had very little occupation by Europeans because they, again, didn't find anything of great wealth. Two of them did develop. One was Pernambuco with the sugar cane in the north. Eventually, the Dutch became involved there. And the other one was São Vicente down here in the, in the south. But eventually, the, uh, they began then to produce crops. Sugar cane was very labor intensive. And so that marks the point at which you begin to get the introduction of slaves into the New World, people drawn from Africa because in many areas, and in particular the areas of Brazil and the Caribbean, the indigenous pop populations were not well suited to the hard, difficult work of farming on these plantations. And uh, so Africans were introduced in for that purpose and of course brought over in bondage. Again, estimates vary widely, but it's estimated that about 30 million people during the whole slave exchange period, all the way up into the middle part of the 19th century, estimate that about 30 million people were removed from Africa, removed in bondage, and, and taken across. 10 million of them arrived in the New World, which tells you something about the conditions aboard the ships. Two out of three died in transit and of course, we're just tossed overboard. The width of the arrows indicate the numbers and the proportions that went to the different areas. So one thing that I think is illustrative about this, about this map, you see the large number 
large percentage into Brazil, into the Caribbean, Middle America area. But look at the limited numbers that were actually introduced into North America. Now, of course, we're aware of the history of slavery in this part of the world, instigation for the Civil War, but the actual number relative to the other areas uh, was relatively, uh, relatively small. You find Brazil then expanding. So initially, this is what belonged to Portugal, but Brazil today includes a much larger area. So they moved inland from the Torres Ilhas line, and the main reason was because of the action of people who were known as the Bandeirantes. And these were, Bandeirantes were leaders of groups of expeditions that moved into the interior looking for anything of mineral value, looking for gold, looking for precious minerals, but also looking for Indians that might be uh, enslaved and then brought back to work in the sugarcane fields. And so they moved through the interior and explored large areas of the interior of Brazil. These were economic in enterprises. They would ultimately re return back to the coast. Most of them left from Sao Paulo, uh, which at that time was a small, small community. Later on, as it came time to decide who owned all of the interior areas of South America, you find the barrier effect of the Andes limiting a great deal the in, uh, intrusions of the Spanish into the areas east of the, east of the mountains. Meanwhile, the Portuguese had already explored large areas, and by that time, the Tordesillas line meant very little, and so you then find Portugal able in the 1800s, uh, able to lay claim to large, or in the 1700s, and then Brazil in the 1800s, able to lay claim to large areas of the interior of South America. Brazil also became independent. Uh, here in 1822, you see Dom Pedro I, son of the king, who had grown up in Brazil, he said, well, uh, his father had gone back to Portugal. He didn't want to return. He stayed behind and eventually simply declared Brazil independent. This is on the, at the edge of the Ipiranga River in Sao Paulo. And uh, so that was it. Very little combat, no, not nearly the amount of warfare that you find in Spanish America. And so Brazil becomes independent. It's interesting to compare the two areas, Spanish America and, and Portuguese America. Spanish America broke up. So Peru uh, quickly divided into two countries, Peru and Bolivia. The area that was New Granada or Gran Colombia split into three countries, Venezuela, Ecuador, and Colombia. Of course, later the, what was the Central American Confederation split apart to various countries. Chile and Argentina never were together, even though administratively on the map it might have shown that. But notice that Portuguese America remained intact, did not break up. Various reasons for that. Population in Brazil was generally settled along the coast. Uh, even though you had these incursions into the interior, this was not like people moving west in the United States looking for new areas to, to set up farming or anything. They, were, they would go into an area and then, and then leave. They, and, uh, you know, there are a variety of other things we can talk about as to why that happened. Well, so there you have, a, in summary, sort of a history of, of Latin America up into the time of independence at a point where you then begin to have independent separate countries going their own way. What I want to talk about today is a little bit about the human landscape in, in Latin America, uh, and in particular the people. We're looking at the Colombian exchange, and we've used this term exchange, and I've talked about this before. In exchange implies uh, swapping. You know, you give me something, I give you something. Uh, and, uh, and as I mentioned before, sometimes that was not a pleasant experience, especially if you're talking, talking about swapping germs that transmit smallpox or, or other deadly illnesses. But there are some aspects of this uh, that do imply an exchange. So we've been looking at uh, different kinds of crops, for example. And so uh, you can see the various crops going in, in different directions. 
uh, Rod and I have talked about this. Um, intercambio, which is a word both in Portuguese and Spanish, is a is a better term, I think, to use in relation to what we're really discussing in this course. And that really means uh, interchange or interrelationship, continuing process of, ex of exchange. Not just I give you something, you give me something as a one-time event, but an ongoing relationship and influence on, on each other, both in Europe and Africa as well as in the New World. So just to use, to, uh, to give you a couple of examples, if you look at the slave trade, that we are still experiencing the consequences of that part of this exchange. You know, it, it happens. Uh, all you have to do is, is read the news, you know, whatever happened last week. Um, you know, the Oscars last Sunday, where there was talk about, well, we have much more diversity. Well, you know, we're still aware of racial tensions and, and divisions and prejudices in our own country, and so that's that's a legacy then of this this period. One thing one thing we often lose track of though is the consequences of all of this back in Africa. Uh, the period of the slave trade and the interaction with the Europeans, in particular, was a time of great suffering and disruption within Africa. Not only violence, but also the creation of uh, animosities. Within, within Africa, most of the slave capturing was actually performed by other African people. And so they would, they would go in and they would attack uh, neighboring villages and imprison populations, carry them down to the coast. And then at the coast, you would find the exchange with the Europeans. And so whereas uh, patterns of hospitality might have been prevalent before this period, uh, a lot of that disappears, that friendliness, hospitality, when you have uh, roaming bands through the interior of Africa going in and capturing and taking young people away and hauling them off into captivity. So those consequences persist. Africa is still marked by periods of violence and uh, enmity among different groups. You know, that's, that's something, uh, I won't say all of the blame, but some of it certainly can be laid at the foot of this particular economic phenomenon that we're talking about. Cultural influences in the Caribbean, parts of South America we'll talk about. So there are all kinds of things that you could discuss as ongoing consequences of these things. Or take something like mercantilism, the economic pattern that was established by the Spanish and the Portuguese, removing wealth, raw materials, then to enrich uh, the countries of the old world. Uh, one of the consequences was the limited amount of intra-regional trade. Uh, countries in Latin America to this day have limited trade contact with each other. They produce raw materials that are then of use in the more developed areas of the world. And so it's, uh, it's this um, bilateral trade relationship instead of they, they, they've tried for years to establish common markets model on the European model, uh, and usually to very little uh, effect. It just doesn't work because they don't have much complementarity, things to exchange with each other. Some of that goes back to the effects of mercantilism. Export-oriented economies, uh, we were just talking about uh, Venezuela and the situation there, and of course we could spend a whole period talking about that country, but Venezuela is highly dependent upon petroleum, that's it. They've attempted to develop industries and other, but it hasn't worked very well. Political fracturing and so on. You could go on and discuss the mercantilism. If you look at just a few notes about that. Here's the world population distribution. Notice the concentrations of the Far East, India, China, Europe, uh, areas in Africa, but not as many people in the area that we're talking about. Middle and South America. In Latin America and the Caribbean, total population would be half a billion. And the dates here of my, my data varies a little. Notice that the, the density values in this region are less than uh, Europe and Africa, certainly less than Asia. 
of the major continental areas, only North America has a more dense population in this region. Annual growth, uh, significant, certainly more than North America or Europe, but nothing compared to Africa, and uh, about on a par with what's happening in Asia. World land area, and uh, so the region we're talking about, Latin America and Caribbean, comprises 13.5% of the total world area. The world population, population in this region is only 8.6%. So it shows you that there is more land per person in Latin America than you find on average in the rest of the world. A uh, couple of ideas of facts about population in middle America. Uh, whereas I told you that the overall density of Latin America is less than the, than the world, uh, when it comes to middle America, the density is actually greater uh, than the world average. Middle America would include Mexico and then the Central American Republic, and also the, the Caribbean region. Most of the people in Mexico are located in the middle part of Mexico, right through here. It's a region known as the Transverse Volcanic Region, or the Central Lakes area around Mexico City, the major cities here and there. You have large, sparsely populated areas up in the desert and down in the Yucatan. In Central America, most of the people are concentrated in the mountainous southwest along the Pacific region, Pacific coast, and around the canal zone in Panama. Now, we keep in mind that the Maya region in here, where the early civilizations were, were up in the eastern region. So you're talking about eastern Honduras and uh, Guatemala, Tikal, and of course, over further up in the, in the Yucatan Peninsula. So there's been a change in the location of the population distribution in, in Middle America. A couple of facts about South America. Again, land area, fourth, fourth largest continent, 12% of the world total. Population, much smaller percent, almost 6% of the world's total. So even though as a region you don't find large inhospitable areas, large deserts, large ice-covered regions, nevertheless it is still sparsely populated. Another fact is most of the people, uh, about half of the people live in Brazil. So you think Latin American Spanish, well, at least half of the people in South America speak Portuguese, not Spanish. Uh, here's one of those images uh, looking down at night, and you can see the pattern sparsely, especially out in the middle. Here's a map of the population. One point I want to make is the peripheral nature. Most of the heavy concentrations of people are around the outside, circling the Amazon region in the, in the middle part of the continent. Down south, Patagonia is sparsely populated. The Atacama Desert is also sparsely populated. So some areas then where you find very, very few people. Uh, so you have this peripheral nature of the, the population. Now notice in the middle of South America, you have a large river flowing through this area, the Amazon River. And despite that, you still find relatively few people. Other parts of the world, you find concentrations of people along the river. So here's the Nile Valley. Look at the population. The Delta and also along the valley. Here's the Valley of the Ganges up in northern India. Heavy concentrations of people. Po Valley, northern Italy, you find concentrations of people. So that's typical of river valleys. You find a lot of people in river valleys. Soil is good, transportation, other things, but not the Amazon. The Amazon is very sparsely populated. Why is that? Well, a variety of reasons. The main factor is because there are very little resources out in this interior region. Tropical forest is notoriously poor not very productive for farming or agriculture. You have highly acid soils, and so uh, the dominant form of, of farming in these areas has been shifting cultivation. You 
little bit until the nutrients are depleted. Then you move on somewhere else and abandon it. And that's the main reason. Periodically, they'll find some mineral deposit, gold or something else. But those things often play out fairly quickly. So that's the main reason for the depopulation. Other facts about population. In this area, large percent urban. This is the old data, and so these numbers would be even higher. If you think about, think about a country like Brazil, well, almost 90% of the people in Brazil live in big cities. So the idea of the, of the, of the peasant out working in the forest or something, you know, that's a myth. That's not the way, the way it is. And urbanization is growing rapidly. Large cities, some of the biggest cities in the world are located down here. So here you see the rank of the, the larger cities in this region. Mexico City, Sao Paulo, a couple of the world, Shanghai, or Tokyo, but nevertheless, huge metropolitan areas. You take the, the population of, uh, let's say, Mexico City. 20 million people is, that's about four times the size of the number of people in all the state of Alabama. So that kind of gives you an idea of how many, what the concentration is. Brazil includes 20 cities, at least over a million people, and maybe more than that. About 99% of the people in this region either speak Portuguese or Spanish, the Iberian. The only area where you'd find something else would be in the Guiana region is the, is the local language, of course, where you find settlement from other European, other European nations. Well, back to this word intercambial exchange. What happened to the culture or to, the, to the, uh, the way of life of these people after the initial contact? You find mixing and blending the various, the various, to greater extent and lesser extent in different areas, intermarried and intermixed, whether they were married or not. And so you have this is, this is very common. I like to think about a pot of stew. You know, we talk about. Um, you know, the, the melting of the United States, when I think of a stew pot, uh, where you get all of this, this mixing. Now, we've talked about this, and we've talked about some aspects of the context. So, for example, if you look at the different crops you know, that Dr. Rod was talking about, there were several things that enhanced the stew pot of the Europeans. Potatoes, corn, other, other sorts of things that came from the New World. Other side of the coin, you find a lot of things that came from Europe that added to the in here in the New World. So you get this blending and mixing. Well, the same thing happened to the races, to the ethnic groups here in the New World. You get the same kind of taking place as a result of this interaction or this exchange among the different among the different groups. And uh, of the various groups that were involved, you have, of course, the indigenous population. You have the arrival of the Europeans contributing to this. Then, of course, the introduction of Africans. And then in addition to that, you have a variety of different groups, recently arrived immigrants. arrived Europeans and people and elsewhere. And all of this then has added into this mixing that is taking place. And it's been a racial or, or ethnic mix. So if you look at the indigenous group here, a couple of examples of in, indigenous, indigenous population, the Tarahumara in Mexico, up in the northwest area, Mayan people of Guatemala, uh, Panama, and then this is actually at Pisco, not, which is near Cusco. Uh, Rokanians in Chile, many of those were, were killed off. Guarani still inhabiting areas of Paraguay. Uh, populations in Brazil, uh, this is a group protesting the construction of dams. Some groups that have just recently been contacted by the outside world, very limited contact. Africans, of course, introduced with the slave trade, large populations in Brazil. That's where these two pictures are, are taken or from. Caribbean area, Haiti, of course, predominantly African. 
to Jamaica. Uh, the dark skin, of course, indicative of that, uh, of that origin. The European, um, and they're not all, these are wealthy people. They're not all wealthy, by the way. Uh, in uh, more recently arrived populations in Argentina, Argentina is, most people in Argentina are descended of recently arrived Italians or other Europeans, I should say other Europeans. And the Boca region in Buenos Aires is famous, and of course the Congo and all of that. Santa Catarina, notice the Germanic influence down in that area. Other areas, a lot of Japanese descendants in Brazil. Of course, in the Guianas, you find East Indians introduced to uh, things, but also important parts. So, a variety of different groups and making up the overall culture, society within Latin America. So, you get this human mixing, all this mixing up. Uh, back in earlier times, we don't do this so much anymore, but there were efforts to classify people according to race racial classification. And so they would look at physical characteristics, the color of the skin, the shape of the nose, and they would classify different people, different populations in that fashion. Uh, and that's a hopeless exercise anyway. Then, of course, you could look at cultural traits, a little more solid ground when you do your belief system other aspects of culture. Today, there's a population of tracing your ancestry, genetic marker. Or you got in trouble doing that, you know. To, uh, your ancestors are. Uh, you can, again, if you, if you trace your, your ancestry, you know, what, what part of the old world did they, did they um, you know, and this, this is largely geography. What we do in the United States and what most, I won't say most, many other countries do today is it's all about self-identity. When the census sur survey comes around, it's up to you to mark what your ethnicity is. You mark it. You know, they don't send the police out and check and see if you, if you answered it truthfully. And so, and that's true in Latin America as well. So a lot of this this ethnicity that, that, that you read about, or, or that, we're, in fact, we'll talk about here, is really self-identification in, in a lot of respects. So you got a variety of, a variety of different groups. I like to take pictures of children here and there. Uh, this, the, as I said, that the practice used to be to go around and try to classify people. And so you had these charts with uh, different sort of racial characteristics. So you're supposed to be able to look at the face of these people and, and then uh, whoever you're interviewing and say, well, okay, you belong in this category. And therefore, in some cases, it really applied to what kinds of rights and privileges you might have. You know, what is your level of participation? Uh, I don't know of anybody that's doing that anymore. But we still tend to look at facial characteristics and try to place people here or there. But that's, again, that's kind of a, a useless exercise. So major categories, of course, white, black from African indigenous, mulatto, mixing of black and white, very common in many areas of Latin America. Mestizo, again, Indian and white, uh, mixing together. Much rarer are the categories where you find Indians and blacks uh, uh, together, Zambo or Kafuzo simply because the blacks were brought over in areas where there was a lack of indigenous labor. You know, the Indians and the, and the Africans were essentially fulfilling the same function, that is providing physical hard labor for the o overlords. And so that mixing, uh, they, they simply were not as common in, in the same areas. And of course, Asian would be another category. Just to show you some of the data, though, in Argentina, predominantly white. And again, as I mentioned, most of the people there are descended from recently arrived Europeans, immigrants, not only Italians, but 
more recent Spanish, Irish, German. Brazil, more of a mixed situation. Whites, but also mulattoes. Blacks, pure blacks, not as much, but a lot of uh, intermixing between the whites and the blacks during the, during the colonial slave period. Ecuador, predominantly indigenous. Uh, and so you find indigenous, and again, the mestizo would be European and Indian. Mexico, again, similarly, mestizo. Well, what I want to get into for a little bit, and I'll give you a break here in just a minute, I want to talk about syncretism. What we've been talking about is, is uh, racial and ethnic mixing, but I want to look at cultural characteristics, uh, elements associated with the society and the culture of the different groups. Talk about the blending and interaction of these, of these groups. And that could be religion, it could be any one of these, arts, music, food, all of these that are elements or characteristics of the culture of the society within these areas. Again, keep in mind the idea of a mixing pot where all of this stuff gets blended together. So if you look at language, in many areas you had native languages being spoken. Today there are a couple of areas, not many, but a few areas where the indigenous language is still dominant. And uh, so in the Andes region, for example, Quechua, which was the old language of the Incas and Aymara, which is spoken in Bolivia, are still widely spoken as a primary language. Now, everybody I've known who speaks these languages also speaks Spanish. So they may grow up speaking uh, Quechua in the village, but they do know Spanish, which is the national language. So I thought I'd show you a little example of somebody speaking, interacting in Quechua. So he's speaking Spanish right now. This, this song's sad. This is, a, this is an evangelical group where the missionaries have gone in and introduced Christian faith. Sometimes, sometimes he cries when he sings this song. He's so sad when he cries. Quiscamanta corona taro arcos panco Jesus ne fau maya manchora y corocaco Así cospa facha y anta y arcos panco Sami poca facha guanta chora y corocaco Así con ancoba I don't understand the word except Jesus, <laughs> which they All right, let me show you one more. Another area where they speak, uh, still speak a lot of the, uh, a couple of areas in southern South America, Guarani still spoken widely in Paraguay, Mapuche in parts of Chile, not as, not as widespread. A lot of Paraguay is really kind of a mixture of Spanish and Guarani, and it's almost, you know, it's like a, a separate or different language. Again, the concept of intermixing of some of these things. And so let me play a little bit of uh, this guy's speaking Guarani. They're talking to him in Spanish and Portuguese. So he's speaking the Guarani. Jack, can you turn up the sound a little bit? Can I put a plata también? Oh, yeah. Yeah, but I'm going to go to the house. 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 I'm going to go
Él vive donde? ¿Dónde él vive? Where is he live? Acá cerca. Pero él trabaja mejor que ese que el que, que se fue a su casa. ¿En serio? Él trabaja mucho mejor. Ah. Él es de Brasil. Sí. Ah. Brasileño. Te embogo azul. <risa> <risa> I don't know what the Bobasu, I know there's a Babasu, which is a kind of a palm tree, but he said Bobasu or Bombasu, I'm not sure what that is. Okay, let's take a break and we'll come back and look at some other stuff. Ready? Get back to, back to our discussion here. Okay. Yes. Well, I'm I'm sure there there's a lot of study and research on on a lot of that, you know, within the realm of linguistics, you know, there are people studying these things all the time. Part of what's happened, of course, with the indigenous languages is because so many people died as a result of the diseases, many of these groups became sort of isolated islands of culture, and what might have existed as, as interaction sort of disappeared. Their interaction then turns out to be interaction with the outsiders, with the blacks, with the whites instead of with each other. So, but I'm sure there's, there's ample research on that. I'm just not familiar with it. Okay, well, again, back to the language pots. So you have old world languages, new world languages, and uh, to be honest, the, the influence of the Europeans on the, on the new world was much more significant. After all, the official language in these countries is European, it's Portuguese, it's Spanish, or in a few areas, you know, Dutch or French. But there was some movement back in the other direction, so I'll show you a few things. Here are some words in Spanish that come from Native American uh, sources. So, cacao, of course, from the Nahuatl. Canoe, canoa, was the, the word in the Caribbean in the native language, and of course that's been appropriated not only in Spanish, but also in English. And you can see some of the other ones all the way down. Some of them obvious, coyote, uh, but um, let's see, guava, hello. Anyway, tubarón, tibarón, comes from Arawak. Uh, Arawak, Taino and Arawak are, are similar. They're basically part of this part of the same group. Arawak were people from North and South America that moved to the Caribbean and then were a major source of the population within that area. Nahuatl, these would be of, uh, from Central Mexico. Portuguese words, uh, again, originating from African languages. Garapa, sugarcane juice, nene, baby. Bagunsa means a mess. Cachaça, if you've been to Brazil, you know what cachaça is. Alcoholic drink, maluco, crazy, kiabo, okra, anger, batuki, moleki is a is a is a bad little boy. Samba, music, kumundongo is a mouse. Kashumba, any guess as to what kashumba is? Kashumba is mumps, the disease. <laughs> Okay, remember all that. <laughs> okay, talk about religion. Similar kinds of syncretism in religion as well, where you have a blending of different religious traditions from different parts of the world. Of course, first thing the, the Europeans did was to celebrate Mass and to introduce Christianity in, 
into the new world. And we're familiar with this. We find uh, all over the southwestern United States, we find missions. This, this is San Diego, I think. Uh, Virgin of Guadalupe, I'm sure you've heard of that. Jesuits, very active, especially in parts of South America. This is an old part of their area of, uh, of instruction down in Paraguay. They established the city of Sao Paulo, for example, was founded by two Jesuit priests uh, named Ancheta and Nobrega. Big cities will all have a central cathedral, which is dominant. So there's Lima's cathedral. Here's uh, Catedral da Sé, which is the dominant church in the middle of Sao Paulo. Bogota. Here's the modern cathedral. Evangelicals is spreading throughout Latin America. Guatemala, it's the dominant religion. Evangelical Protestant Christianity. And uh, you have huge um, areas where they worship. Some of them, not all of them, many of them small. You still find evidence, of course, of some of the some of the early gods and religions. Yeah, John. Uh, <laughs> Somebody else I have to answer that. I'm not I'm not aware. <laughs> but not they didn't they don't call her not by the same name. I mean, the Virgin, of course, has made various appearances. Yeah, Lourdes is one of them. I'm trying to think of another. In Brazil, there's uh, Aparecida, which is a patron saint of Brazil. But again, it's all the Virgin Mary making a miraculous appearance. We've had cases here in the States where you see you know, some kind of strange reflection in the window of a building or something, you know, that kind of stuff. Everybody get, goes. And, uh, anyway, if you go to Tiwanaku, They'll talk about the uh, ancient beliefs of the ancestors of the Incas, Aztec religion, Mayas, uh, famous for their violence, you know, human sacrifice. I'm uh, sort of glad that that didn't come our way and we do that routinely. African influence, very common, of course, in religion. It's interesting to see then, talk about syncretism, you find various ancient worships, and uh, this is in Haiti, and that, so you'll see religious, or you'll see Christian symbols, the cross, some Christian saints, but also mixed in with some of the voodoo culture within that area, of course, originating in parts of Africa. And I'm gonna show you a little more of that in just a little bit. Took a picture, this is in Brazil, of a little shop in Tiascava where they're selling, again, various um, various uh, little statues of uh, religious saints, some of them Christian, but also a lot from the Orishas, which is from the Candomblé religion in that part of Brazil and various potions and so on. Um, talking about Brazil, there, there's significant, significant presence of African-derived religions in various areas of Brazil, in particular where the African populations were very strong, and that would be in areas like Bahia or Rio de Janeiro, areas along the coast. So yeah, their gods are called Orishas, and uh, again, you get this intermixing with some of the Christianism. I'll show you a little video of what's called a terreno. This is in Salvador in the state of Bahia. So we're in Salvador de Bahia, which was the first capital in Brazil. And it was also where they had the l largest port receiving the most amount of uh, African slaves. Can you turn and it up so a little? Because of its history, there is a very important Afro-Brazilian community here. And this is also where Candomblé, which is an Afro-Brazilian religion, started. This is a, a very important Candomblé terreiro, or temple, one of the most important ones in the country. And uh, it's also a national heritage site and tonight they're actually hosting a big important ceremony and we've come here to see it. Candomblé is an Afro-Brazilian religion which was formed by several um, traditions of the African continent. There were several 
inflows of the slave trade. Oh, they brought with them their religion and their faith and their social structure. In this tradition of Candomblé, uh, we believe in one God, which is called Olodumare, you know, the, the all-powerful, all almighty God. And then we believe in deities, which are representations of energies of nature. In Candomblé, the deities are referred to as Orishas. There are hundreds of them reflecting different manifestations of God, like fire, water, or war. When the Orishas come, come to Earth through their followers, um, they dance, and we believe that the actual deity, he comes to the Earth through that body of that person, which for us is, is something very good because we are um, able to engage with our deities. For many years, Candomblé was driven underground and the tradition still maintains a level of secrecy. We received special permission to film the ceremony. Candomblé was persecuted by the police and the religious authorities in Brazil, so anything that went against it uh, was considered savage or witchcraft and had to be, you know, just exterminated. In the temple's design, you can still see how Candomblé followers once disguised their traditions from authority. For instance, in this altar here, uh, it used to be in the old days, it used to be full of uh, Catholic saints, and uh, the, the Orishas, there's a door behind the altar, and the Orishas used to be hidden inside, okay? So the, 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 the Orisha shrines, they used to be hidden inside, in the shell, because when the police would come to check what people were doing here, if they were playing drums and doing African rituals, they would be praying to the Catholic saints. Today, Candomblé remains a melting pot of a religion, drawing followers from all over Brazil and the world. I'm Mariana Vanzella in Salvador da Bahia, and this is Fusion. The, um, it's usually forbidden to film, and so it's unusual to, to see video of one of these, uh, one of these ceremonies. They, uh, they actually believe that one of these gods will, will come in and take over the body of those people, and it's, un, it's not uncommon for the individuals to go into sort of a trance where they, uh, you know, their eyes turn back and they, they, so they're expressing then the will of the God under those circumstances. But a lot of syncretism, a lot of mixing of Catholic and, and symbols from Africa. One of the things related, along with talking about the African influence, is the, what's sort of a, known as a martial art in Brazil. It's called capoeira. It's not really a martial art, it's more of a dance. But it started all out as a martial art, as a way of defending themselves. What would happen would be uh, the slaves would, have, uh, would not have access to weapons. And so they developed uh, ways of fighting using their feet and their hands, similar to oriental uh, methods of combat. And uh, they would become quite proficient at this. But when the, the uh, plantation overlord or somebody would come around, the police, then they would, in, when they would be practicing these combats, they would then turn it into a dance and act as if they were dancing instead of fighting. And so that's what has been, what has persisted as capoeira. I'll show you a little bit of that right here. You can see. Very traditional, the musical instruments, the sound is all part of it. The objective is to come as close to the other person as possible without actually hitting each other. Believe it 
or not. That's what I'm going to show you right now. It's available right here in Auburn, Alabama. It's called Brazilian Body Workout. And uh, they, so they're doing, there's a group that, that's doing this. Here, there's a movement to try to get this incorporated as an Olympic activity where you, and it would be more like uh, ice dancing, I guess, and, and, you know, some of the combat stuff. But it's an, an interesting, it's a worldwide phenomenon organization. And it's all based on this, this background of pretending to, to, to dance when you were really learning how to fight. They don't really fight anymore. Okay, well, we could talk about architecture. Uh, I'm not going to, I don't know as much about this as maybe some of you do. But a lot of, uh, of course, indigenous architecture replaced by European architecture, both ancient and modern. This is both, these are both views of Mexico City. You can talk about uh, gender relationship. Not many Islamic populations in Latin America, a few here and there. But one thing that, of course, is original in Latin America or associated with Latin America is machismo. Men being in charge, being served by women. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and of course the flip side of that is what's called Mari marianismo which is the idea that the woman's role is to be submissive and subservient just like the mother of Jesus you know and uh, now there is pushback against that it says neither saint nor whores we're just women and so the there are campaigns throughout Latin America to try to combat this, which is a, it's a, a, a real issue in, in some areas, although I think disappearing from the scene. Women have become much more outspoken. And, uh, clothing style, we could talk about that. Integration throughout Latin America, basically Western, European, North American styles of clothing. But you still find areas where you find uh, traditional dress, especially out in the back way. This is Chichicastenango in, uh, in Guatemala. And in Guatemala, now actually I took these pictures, I guess it's about 20 years ago, but I'm, I'm guessing it's probably changed, but maybe still somewhat like this. You can tell where somebody's from by the, by the way they dress. Each, each group will have a a particular outfit, both men and women, and uh, not, not of course, in the, the big cities, but throughout the countryside. Popular music, uh, a lot of, we were just talking about this, some of the, at least in my opinion, some of the best music in the world comes from Latin America, and it's contributed a lot to sound around the, around the globe, and different regions have, of course, different music characteristics or cultures, Buenos Aires, tango, Malaga. This is in Peru.
room at a nursing home and the typical music of the Andes, of the, of the Incas, and uh, demonstrated uh, several, of the, several of the flutes that they, that they play in that area. Oh, that's quite traditional. And I could spend days talking about different musics uh, from various parts, but I'm going to show you one more from one of my favorites. Uh, I grew up in Brazil, and of course, that's the land of samba. And what a lot of people over here play as samba, in my mind, is not true to the, to the, to the source. So I'm going to play a little bit of Marquinha da Vila, let you listen to him. He's a popular singer in Brazil. Here's a map showing some of the uh, cumbia has sort of taken over much of Latin America. Uh, actually originated in Colombia. Different kinds of sounds from Cuba, of course, Mexico, and so it would be an interesting, interesting um, discussion to talk about all the music in Latin America. But here's Martinho da Vila. Martinho da Vila. The samba ryth rhythm is derived from Africa, and it's kind of a, an easygoing, general rolling rhythm. Canta, canta, minha gente. Deixa a tristeza pra lá. Canta forte, canta alto. Que a vida vai melhorar. Canta, canta, minha gente. Deixa a tristeza pra lá. Canta forte, canta alto. A vida vai melhorar. A vida vai melhorar. A vida vai melhorar. A vida vai melhorar. life's gonna get better. Cantem o samba de roda, o samba canção e o samba rasgado. Cantem o samba de black, o samba moderno e o samba quadrado. Cantem ciranda, o freio, o coco machês, baião enxachado. Mas não cante essa moça bonita, porque ela está com o marido do lado. Canta, canta, minha gente. Deixa a tristeza pra lá. Canta forte, canta alto. A vida vai melhorar. Canta, canta, minha gente. Deixa a tristeza pra lá. Canta forte, canta alto. A vida vai melhorar. A vida vai melhorar. A vida vai melhorar. A vida vai melhorar. Quem canta suas males espanta. Lá em cima do morro, o sambando no asfalto. Eu. Well, anyway. So, what's happened with music then is you find appropriating some of the indigenous sounds, borrowing from Africa, from other parts of the world, and uh, blending all of that together and coming up with something that's fairly original or unique different areas in Latin America. I thought, given, I think it's next week, Mardi Gras, right, coming around, and so maybe a good uh, illustration of syncretism would be to talk about carnival in uh, Brazil, or carnaval, as, they, as we say down there. The word means meat. Meat, of course, carne, take away, levati, from Latin, Take away the meat. So that's the beginning of Lent. Lent you're going to take the meat away. And of course, it's a time when they um, traditionally, I guess, sort of let loose. You do all the things you're not supposed to before you uh, go into a more saintly period of your life, which is the time of Lent. It's tied to the Christian cap, parties, parades, alcohol, sexual liberty. You know, do everything as long as your mother's not watching. It's a, a, a festivity or a ceremony or something that you find around the world in different areas, different places. Here it is in Venice. Uh, and you can see very elaborate. Here it is in our part of the world, Fat Tuesday in New Orleans or Mobile. But nothing compares to Carnival in Rio. You know, that's, people get on cruise ships and go down to Rio for no other purpose than to celebrate Carnival. And it truly is a, quite a spectacle. And what it does is... <laughs> what I'm going to show you here, this is what's called a 
an Escola de Samba, Samba school. Throughout Brazil, you have groups that throughout the year will practice their drumming and rhythms. And they'll just get together in the evening and practice and do this. Not much in the way of melody, but just, just practicing their rhythms. Much of that, again, derived from traditions in Africa that, that are brought over. And so here's, here's one of them. In Brazil, a lot of the parades, you know, we'll have a marching band go down for Christmas parade or something. He essentially drum and bugle, a lot of drumming and maybe a trumpet or bugle, and that'll be it. So that's, that's part of it. Well, before carnival, groups get together, and this is throughout the country, but it's most prominent in Rio de Janeiro. In the poor neighborhoods of the big city, it's a large city, they will spend large amounts of their money they have limited resources to begin with, building floats, uh, developing costumes throughout the year, practicing their program that will then all go on display uh, at carnival time. There will be big parades throughout the city with hundreds of thousands of people, or at least tens of thousands of people watching on television, and that's all that happens for the three days of the carnival. And so part of what goes into it is the, is the basic rhythms that come from Africa. A lot of themes that are derived from native uh, Brazilians, from indigenous populations. Now, most of the indigenous people in Brazil died, and so the actual influence is not so great. Aware of the large areas of the Amazon and the characteristics of the animals and the indigenous populations. Themes of carnival pick up on this. So appropriated what I think is tradition right here from the United States. So the Rose Bowl, uh, Macy's Parade, this idea of creating big floats and big displays, march down the street with this stuff. So I think that comes from over here. And nudity is part of it. And who doesn't like nudity? So this goes on for hours and days. Each one of these is a display from one of these poor neighborhoods.
had to edit that out and down a, a good bit. I had to watch it a lot, though. <laughs> It is. I did. That's all I notice anyway. <laughs> okay, so anyway, the overall theme then is looking at the Colombian exchange and how different groups interact and not only the blending of the races, but also the intermixing of the way of life, you know, the different cultures, the language, all of that gets mixed up and you end up then with something unique and different coming out, sort of the outgrowth of, of all of that, people in their culture. So much more we can talk about. Uh, so just to give you, we can talk about politics, education, all of these things, sports, you know, all of the history of that, et cetera, et cetera. So thank you. So four minutes for questions. Anybody? Okay, have a good day.